Hi there, this is Mary Poplin with Boris Effects, and today we're doing office hours. Now, normally I would say we do office hours every Tuesday at 1 p.m., um, but next week is going to be my last office hours. I am uh, stepping away from Boris Effects and stepping over to a different opportunity. And I'm really excited that you're here. We're going to talk about stabilization, but I wanted you to know that you should join us next week because we'll also be talking about, you know, basically saying goodbye to everybody. Now, I do believe that office hours is going to continue. It just will continue without me. So if you want to continue to get tips and tricks for how to use the Boris Effects software from Mocha to Continuum to... Um, Silhouette and Sapphire, uh, you still need to come to office hours and enjoy it, but I will not be doing them um, past next week, which is the 28th, and I'll see you there. So today, we're going to talk about stabilization, and we're going to talk about what to do, how to look at a shot, how to decide how to stabilize a shot. A lot of shots, you know, don't need just like a point of stabilization. Sometimes they need planar data to get the, the information done. Um, as usual, I'm going to need you to ask your questions in the chat and I'll look over here and see them. I can see that we have a lot of nice comments over there and I appreciate that. Thank you. Um, I'm moving over to frame IO over on the Adobe side. Um, so I'm not going far. You'll be able to see me again. I'll see you at trade shows at the very least. All right. So for the continuum and Boris effects and Sapphire and silhouette side of things, we're gonna talk about stabilization today with Mocha. So let me cut over to my picture in picture here. Here we are. All right, now we're gonna talk a little bit about how to think about our um, stabilization. And what I tend to call it is I tend to call it artistic stabilization. Now, why do I call it artistic stabilization? Well, one of the reasons I call it artistic stabilization is because you really have to think about how you wanna stabilize a shot. Now, if I wanted to lock down this shot entirely, it looks like it's either drone or handheld, okay? And if I want to stabilize the shot, I've got to think about what to track. So let's go over to our effects and presets and let's grab Mocha and drag and drop it right onto our clip and it will read off our timeline. And I really do appreciate all the nice comments in the chat. Thank you guys. I will miss y'all too. Let's go ahead and launch Mocha. It's going to read directly from our timeline and we're gonna see this shot and we can play it. All right. So now if I hit play, you can see that we've just got a lot of wobble here in the ground and we wanna lock that down. All right, but how do we lock it down? Well, we need to be really thoughtful about what we track. Sometimes people might try to track like the side over here and maybe add the side over here the problem is, is if we try to track this area, what I want you to see really quickly is that we have a lot of secondary motion here in the trees, okay? And that would not be a good area to track, all right? Another thing that somebody might try to do is just track this background horizon, okay? And that's just a really small area to track and will not get you good information. So here's what I recommend. I recommend tracking on either side of this road, okay? And also that back horizon area, okay? And the reason that I recommend this is because there's a lot of parallax in this shot. Um, it doesn't really look like it, but there's a lot of Z, Z wobble. And because of that, if we try to stabilize from just the background area, we won't get all of the information that we need. So what I want is I wanna grab this whole plane all of this information and I wanna stabilize based off of that. So here's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna track translation, scale, rotation, shear, and perspective. Now, actually we wanna track this shot from the end to the beginning. And that's because this guy is walking forward into the shot. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna delete all our keyframes real quick. And I'm just going to make sure that my shapes are where I want them. Track translation, scale, rotation, shear, and perspective and hit track backwards, all right? And because we're using GPU tracking, it's tracking really fast. So I wanna clarify about GPU tracking. If you're tracking something that has a lot of similar texture, it's probably a good idea to turn GPU tracking off. But if you're tracking something like this and the texture is very different, 
can just go ahead and keep GPU tracking on and it'll be a lot faster. Somebody the other day thought I was saying that GPU tracking is not as accurate. That is not true. GPU tracking is plenty accurate. It's mostly that if you're tracking areas of similar texture, the GPU tracker can get a little confused because it'll look at a bit of texture and it'll say, ah, that's good enough. And it might not be good enough. It just might be similar enough, right? All right, so there's our track for our background. Now here is why we track from the end to the beginning. You see how when I aligned the surface tool to the ground, I aligned it so that it doesn't shoot off screen too far. If I put this all the way down here, what'll happen is my surface tool will shoot off screen and there goes my tracking data. You see how it disappears? That's because the surface goes behind the camera. When you're tracking, you wanna make sure you don't do stuff like that or your track will be bad, okay? So let's put this information back up here. There we go. So if you've ever seen your surface tool disappear, make sure your surface tool does not disappear by putting it further back in Z space in your shot so that it does not go behind the camera. All right, let me make sure that we have no more questions while we're going, okay. All right, so now I have a, I have a track. The track looks good. I'm feeling good about it. So now what I can do is I can try to stabilize my shot. Now I can stabilize this in a couple of ways and this is why I call it artistic stabilization. I can try to stabilize with all motion and maximum smoothing, but that's gonna get us kind of this weird Stanley Kubrick effect. We don't really want that, okay? So if we want to stabilize based off of this information, we could try doing adding frames to a frame list, which will hold our frame. So we'll say, I want this to be full screen at the end and I want it to be full screen at the beginning. And so it'll try to stabilize between those two points. But you see that still gets us kind of a weird wobble in our trees because of the way the camera has built in artifacts inside of it. So we don't necessarily wanna do that. So let's take all motion off and let's instead, let's try to stabilize translation X, translation Y and rotation. All right, and now we end up with something a lot smoother. Okay, but it's still wobbling a little bit. So let's Let's also stabilize our zoom. All right, and that gives us an, a, a lot better. We can also try shear, but we wanna turn off perspective. Shear, I don't like though, because it still wobbles with that frame. So let's go ahead and turn all of these off and hit play. And you can see my stabilization looks really nice based off just a few adjustments. So it's really important when you're stabilizing to know what you're stabilizing and why. Now for shots like this, because the parallax is so deep and because there's so many trees that are overlapping, you're never gonna get something that looks perfect, but you will get something that looks smooth. And that is the difference, okay? If you try to do like a warp stabilize on this and try to nail down those trees in the background, you're gonna have a bad time because of all of this motion here in your tree branches, it's pretty windy. So when you're stabilizing, you wanna think of what to track, why to track and how to track it. Now, I could get totally different results if I tracked something else in this shot. So let's let's stabilize this. Let's call this ground stable. Okay, and let's go ahead and hide it. And in our track, we'll just go ahead and turn the tracker off. Now, let's say I wanna stabilize based on this guy. Okay, let me just draw a quick little shape right around his head. And we're gonna track translation scale and probably just rotation. And we're gonna track that through the shot. All right. Now, if we stabilize our shot based on the guy, let's go ahead and turn the visuals off on that, go back to our stabilize. Let's stabilize all motion and maximum smoothing. And you can see now we're stabilizing based on him. We're keeping him right in the middle of the frame and everything is bouncing around him. And that gives us kind of an interesting visual effect. And the same thing, if we don't wanna lose all these edges here that are in black, we can go ahead and add to our frame list and that will make it full frame at the beginning and end, and it'll try to stabilize between the two. So now we can go to our borders and we can say, hey, I want you to center this, I want you to zoom, and I want you to apply a crop, and let's play and see what that looks like. So now we're stabilizing just around our guy, and you see we've pinned him in the middle of the screen. It gives us kind of this weird shaky horror effect. Now, this I don't feel like is useful for this shot, but for something like, if you wanna have like a Stanley Kubrick zoom in effect where you're like trying to focus on some guy and he feels like out of place or out of sorts, this is a really good option to do. Um, another story I like to tell is, you know, I was helping these people with a documentary one time, I was doing some consulting for them and they had shot this like super serious interview in this guy's like childhood bedroom. 
And the problem with shooting this super serious scene in this guy's childhood bedroom is it was the end of the day and the camera guy was super tired. And so he just kept like wobbling the camera in a way that was really distracting from the interview. And what we were not able to track the background wall because the depth of field was super huge um, in the shot. And that depth of field meant the back wall moved very different in parallax from the front objects in the scene. And there was nothing else in the front of the scene to track to stabilize off of. So what we did is we actually stabilized based off the guy's motion. Now, one more thing I want to show you about that is we used the setting um, instead of maximum smoothing, we smoothed every number of frames for that. And what that did is that takes some of the wobble out. So let's say we want to smooth every five frames here. Now, if I go ahead and hit play, you can see that a lot of the wobble is gone from our shot. Let's go to center zoom and apply crop so you don't see that edge. You can see that a lot of the wobble is gone, but we're still keeping a little bit of that handheld motion because we're smoothing over a, a less of a length of frames. We're not trying to lock it down from the first frame to the last frame. We're trying to lock it down every five frames, okay? So that's what this number means. So you can lock it down depending on how much motion you need to save. Now, this is also really helpful when you start to lose the edges of a shot, okay? So I hope that makes sense. That's kind of the very top level um, overview of what Stabilize does. Um, we, do have, we do have things like autofill and Stabilize, but in my opinion, you really shouldn't be using this unless you're using it on something that was shot either stop motion or over time or has like a lot of edges that you can pull from. Um, because if you try to use autofill, what it will try to do is do a remove around the edges, basically the same way the remove tool works. If the pixel data isn't there, you're just going to end up with something that looks kind of funky. Um, use autofill when you need it at, at your risk, okay? So now, I've talked a little bit about the frame list and what the frame list does. I've talked about motion and motion stabilization and how you can stabilize objects. And I've talked about smoothing, also center zoom and apply crop. Um, I kind of want to show you a couple of different shots and let's talk about how this is practical, okay? So let's save this and close it. If anybody has any questions, please put them in the chat and I will see them and I will respond. All right. So when we want to render this back to our scene, we can go into our module renders. We can say, hey, I want you to render a stabilize right back to After Effects and it will render right back to my timeline. All right, so... Let's check out some other things. Okay, let's let's check out this shot really quick. This is another walking shot, and I'm gonna talk about a plane too. So the reason I decided to do stabilization for this office hours was because we had somebody on the forums that said they've watched a lot of stabilization videos but don't really understand what stabilization is doing or how to make their shot work. So I figured I would show that. Um, I wanna talk about this shot really quick. This is another walking shot, um, but we're going to talk about a plane as well later on and how to stabilize that. So let's launch Mocha and let's look at this shot. Okay, so in this shot, you can see, let's play. You can see this is pretty wobbly. All right, I'm gonna just scroll through really quick. You can see this is pretty wobbly and it goes a little bit out of focus. So what we're gonna try to do is we're gonna try to track a couple of these columns and see how this stabilizes. Now, I already know, just from experience, uh, that we're going to have a little bit of problems with this shot for a couple of reasons. All right, and I'll show you what those are. So there is a lot of parallax in this shot, and there are a lot of columns that go off into Z space. So however we stabilize here, we're not going to lock this whole shot down and have it look nice, no matter what kind of stabilization we use. But let's go ahead and try to track these these columns here um, and I'll mm, actually let's uh let's track them all on the same plane and try to get the camera motion so use the add to x blind tool all right so even though these are not on the same plane there is a method to my madness here okay the reason I am tracking these together even though they're not on the same plane is I'm trying to get the motion of the camera and let's track translation scale rotation shear and perspective all right now, once again, we're using GPU tracking, so it's pretty fast. If I were trying to use CPU tracking on this, this is a lot of pixels to track in a 4K shot. Eh, it might take some time, okay? But the reason I'm tracking the edges and the middle on this shot on roughly the same plane or as much of the same plane as possible is because I'm trying to get that camera motion, all right? 
When you're tracking for stabilization, you're worried about the camera motion more than you are the planar motion. And the exception to that is if you have a really good ground plane to track, in which case then you can really worry about planar motion. But for a shot like this where there's no ground plane available and you've got a whole lot of detail, you probably want to track edges and middle of the shot. Okay, and that can give you a lot of a lot of information to work with. So we're not really going to try to do stabilization for all motion here, and I'll show you why. Okay, um, I have a question over here that says, I, I took a similar shot to this, um, but when I tried to track the shot, the lens distortion was a problem because I don't have any reference. Yes. So if you want to track a shot like this that's got a lot of lens distortion, go over here, solve for a lens first. And if you go back one or two office hours, um, I can't remember which one, but a couple of office hours back, um, I talked about how to solve with splines for lens distortion. And you want to do that before you start tracking, not afterwards, if you have lens distortion in a shot. Then you should be able to do a stabilize after you've um, done your lens distortion, done your track, and then you move on to the stabil uh, stabilization from there. The problem is, is whenever you stabilize, you're still going to have a lot of warp. So you might have better results if you take the shot, solve for the lens, flatten the shot, and either render that or pre-compose that, and then use stabilization on your flattened shot. Because if you try to stabilize with a severe lens curve, there's not going to be much to stabilize that doesn't have that warp in it. So I hope that makes sense. Um, all right. So now in my track, let's go over here and let's go to our stabilized module. So let's show you what all motion and maximum smoothing looks like for this shot. Uh, spoiler alert, it's going to be kind of funny looking. Or it should be kind of funny looking. Yeah, it is. You see how we get this warp in the background where everything's kind of going up and blurry? We don't really want that, okay? But here's what we can do. We can take rotation and zoom, stabilize that, and we can stabilize that with maximum smoothing. And we get something that looks a lot better. However, now we need to add that frame list. So let's add a frame, full frame at frame one. And I want to say, hey, at the end, I also need you to make it full frame. And so now we end up with something that is a lot more smooth. Okay. Now, if I try to center zoom and apply the crop on this, we're going to end up with a, another slight problem. And I'll show you here in a second what to do with that. So, but you can see this looks a lot smoother. And even though we've got that warp in the background, you're not noticing it over time because we did a full frame at the end and full frame at the beginning. And that hides a lot of errors, you know, that you would see if you tried to just base it off of one frame. It animates between two frames. Now, if we come over here and use center zoom and apply crop, we're gonna lose a lot of our guy, like more guy than I would like to lose, especially here at the beginning. So let me add one more full frame to my frame list. And let's actually, let's undo it. Let's add it right here. Okay. And let's undo full frame here. So we're trying to get more of our guy back whenever we can. And that looks pretty good to me. We don't lose all of them. We lose his hands a little bit, but that's also because if you look in the original clip, there's not a whole lot there to work with. All right, so here's our stabilize, and you can see that we're trying to get as much as possible of our guy. All right, so let's play. And that looks like it was shot not on a tripod, but at least with a steady cam, right? And that's about, I feel like that's about as good as you're gonna get on a shot like this. It's stable. It's not distracting. You're not seeing a lot of wobble in the background, but what you are seeing is a nice smooth transition from, from one frame to the next while using the frame list to keep as many frames as possible. Okay, and there we go. That's how I would stabilize that shot. So the frame list does show keyframes. Um, I have a question here. Um, I noticed when you set a frame list, it doesn't show any keyframe or anything. How do you know where you set a keyframe? Go here into the dope sheet. If you go right here into the dope sheet into your stabilize, 
You should see some keyframes. Let's see. Actually, no, they're not in the dope sheet. I was wrong. Okay, well, you can see right here what your frame list is. So this is 000. This is a time code. But if I was if I was in After Effects and I was in keyframes and not time code, um, you would see what frame list the frame number is, and you could just jump there. You can still jump here on the time code though. So I see this is um, 001123. So 00123. So that is where my next keyframe is for my frame list. All right. So it's right here in the box. All right. I thought it was in the dope sheet. I'll, I'll put that in as a feature request, though, because I would like to see that in the dope sheet as well so that you could delete it in the dope sheet if you wanted to. Um, but yeah, you're right. Anyway, it's in the box. If you want to clear everything out, you can clear everything out, too, um, by deleting them. So, you know, it's very flexible. All right. So. Now, I want to talk a little bit about um, stabilization for shots that are a little bit more complicated. So one of the uh, questions I got was we had a user, they're trying to track airplanes and they were trying to stabilize airplanes and they want it to look really smooth and focus on the plane without cutting the plane off. OK, this is a really tall order. If you don't have the frame information there, um, to keep the plane inside, you're going to have a hard time. So here's what I would suggest is if you're doing something like filming quick moving objects, fast moving objects, etc., and you know that you're going to have to do stabilization because you don't have a steady cam and you're not able to track it, please shoot in a higher res than you think you need so that when you crop in, you still have a high enough res image to be a 2K image or 4K image that you need for your final product which means if you're shooting in, if you need your final to be 4K, you might need to shoot in 6K or 8K. If you need your final project to be 2K, you might need to shoot in 4K or 6K to get the information that you need so that when you crop and stabilize, you don't lose so much of your frame, you don't have anything left. So just be smart about how you're planning your shots. And I know a lot of times after the fact, like people will try to use Mocha as a fire extinguisher, and it does work great as a fire extinguisher, but you really need to plan your shots. So if you have a really specific look you're going for, make sure that you give yourself enough information to get the look that you're getting because Mocha cannot reinvent parts of the frame for you. I mean, it can use a little bit of the, the autofill to try to get the edges, but for something like a plane coming in like this, autofill is not going to get you what you need unless you use it and then you motion blur the absolute heck out of it um, in the background. So. Here's what we're going to do. We're going to track this plane. Well, it's a space shuttle, but a space shuttle is a very fancy plane. Um, and we're going to stabilize based on what this space shuttle is doing. All right. So let's go ahead and hit start. And then I'm going to show you a couple other uh, complex shots as well, because they're kind of a little bit thinking outside the box. Um, I do want to talk about one more thing, though, and that is this. Um, so. I am getting my shots from this place called Pexels. If you are looking at my um, my footage and you feel like you want to follow along or test these on your own, uh, just go to pexels.com where you can download a whole bunch of free footage and you can play with it. So I can go over here and I can type in planes. All right. And now I've got a whole bunch of plane shots that I can look at and then download. Okay. So just make sure that when you um, when you are looking for footage, if you need footage and if you want to follow along with most of my office hours, I, I have so far gotten all of my office hours footage off of Pexels. And I really think that if you go there, you're going to have a much easier time learning how to use the software if you work on the same shots. All right. So now let's come over here and let's track. I'm going to draw a nice little shape right around my space shuttle. And I'm going to just grab all of this right here. OK, we're going to track perspective and we're going to call this um, shuttle. OK, now I'm going to turn my surface tool on and I'm going to align it to roughly the plane that I'm trying to track. Ha 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 to the plane I'm trying to track. It's a joke. I'm so funny. You got to amuse yourself. Okay, so we're going to track um, the side of this 
the side plane of this plane. Um, even though it's curved, this is enough of a plane to track. Okay, so now we're going to track translation, skin rotation, shear, and perspective. And uh, I shouldn't amuse myself, but I do. And I get how silly that is. Um, all right. Let me go ahead and turn my notifications off because I don't want them pinging. Um, all right. Perfect. So now... We're tracking this whole plane and you see how it's sticking on pretty well up oh, i see we lost it a little bit right there no problem we lost it a little bit so here's what i'm going to do i'm going to i'm just going to grab more of the plane hit track forwards so we had a little cloud shadow that you saw and that that disrupted our track a little bit but notice how i'm just grabbing a little bit more of this fin and we're getting more data the smaller this this uh shuttle gets in frame the more problems we're going to have tracking it, okay? And that's because the smaller it gets, the less texture data we have to track, especially since it's just a white object. So notice how I grabbed as much edge as I could, okay? Now that still looks good enough for stabilization to me. That's bouncing all over the screen. It looks pretty good, all right? So let's turn our overlays off and let's jump over to our stabilize module, okay? Let's stabilize with all motion and maximum smoothing and see what this looks like. Terrible. All right, that's not what we want. Okay, we don't want maximum smoothing. Okay, but here's what we do want. We want, well, we might want maximum smoothing, but we want uh, translation, rotation, and zoom. Okay, and now we're going to end up with something that looks a lot nicer. All right, now, why did I pick that? Well, if I tried to stabilize based on the side plane, you saw how it locked everything and warped it around it. We don't want that. We just want to make sure that it's the same in space. Now, I'm actually probably going to turn off zoom as well. And the reason is, is because I want that, I want that plane to get smaller in space because it already does get smaller in space. But I want to make sure that when I am accounting for that, um, I'm not trying to keep it the same size. And zoom will try to keep it the same size in the frame. That's a problem if you have a lot of depth change happening. Now, once again, if you've overshot, like if you've shot this on red footage or something like that with a really nice lens and gotten a lot of crisp data that can handle that sort of depth change, then you know feel free to leave zoom on, but I'm not gonna leave it on for this. And once again, we're gonna use my favorite frame list. We're gonna add a frame at the beginning, add a frame at the end, okay? And now we've got our space shuttle nice and in the center of our screen and it's nice and stabilized. Okay, now, really important that we don't try to leave perspective and shear on for this. It's gonna look weird as all get out if we do that. Okay, so we don't want it to look weird. We want it to look like it belongs in the scene. And we wanna stabilize based on that. And that looks pretty good to me. I can see we had a little bit of a jump in the track there, but we can either use a just track to fix that or we can just live with it. Um, but I think I'd probably like to retract that section. So if we look, where's our jump? Right there. So here's what we're gonna do. We're gonna jump back to our track tab. We're gonna turn our overlays all on. I'm gonna grab a little bit more of this shuttle because now we're really small. And here's the thing about planar data is the further away you get from something, the more likely it is to flatten out. And that's actually just a visual thing, like the way that your eyes work. You know, so the more the more away from an object you get, the further in depth an object gets from you, the more flat it gets. So we're just going to grab the whole side of the shuttle now because we don't have to worry so much about whether or not we're grabbing the, the plane of the shuttle. So let's retract this. And now if we jump back over to our stabilize, let's turn our overlays back off. Let's play that again. We should have something that looks slightly better. So we've got a really rock solid track in the beginning. And as we get further out, we're tracking the translation scale and rotation of the wider object. And that looks pretty good to me. Yeah, it doesn't jump anymore. So do you see how we changed the data and changed our track to get a better track to solve for that? That's where we start to think about like, how is the data looking and how do we manipulate that data in order to get a good stabilization? All right. So if we save this and we close it, we can go to module renders, render and stabilize. 
and that's that's our shot back in After Effects. So here's our original, and it's all over the place. All right, and here's our rendered in Mocha. Let's let that render. And you can see it's nice and smooth right in the, well, let's let it play. Let it finish rendering. Dun, dun, dun. Thank you, After Effects. All right, so now we've got this nice, smooth, smooth track. All right, now this gets used all the time for shots like this. So, you know, unless you're shooting from something that's really stable, it's pretty hard to shoot another plane, especially from another plane. So you always want to think about how to manip manipulate the information. Now, here's another thing I want to show you, which is... I'll talk about this one for a second. How are we on time? Oh, we're great on time. All right, so let's let's talk about this one, actually, because this is a little bit harder. All right, so with this shot, we've got this shot. Now, this shot is a plane coming in for a landing, all right? And we want to stabilize based on the plane itself, okay? So here's the problem with something like that. Now, it's decently smooth, but it's not as smooth as I would like for it to be. So we can stabilize a couple of ways, but what I want to do is I want to stabilize based on the plane, okay? So let's take this shot, and that looks pretty smooth to me because I think they're probably on a, on a tripod, but I want to stabilize based on the plane. I want to keep the plane in the middle of the shot. So let's talk about how we handle that. Um, one of the complaints I got on the forum about this kind of track where they were like, well, what do I do when um, there's a wing that goes over what I'm trying to track? Well, the wing is a totally different set of planar data. Now, there's also a couple of things that we need to do when we track this shot. So if we come in here, we look at this shot. We've got this whole wing we need to worry about, but also the plane's really small here at the beginning and really large here at the end. And I can also see that it's really reflective, okay? You can see down here where we're reflecting the snow on the bottom of the plane right here. Just look right here. Okay, that's gonna affect our data because Mocha is gonna treat that like a texture. So what we need to do is we need to figure out how to track this plane for a stabilization. So the first thing we're gonna do is we're gonna come in here and I'm gonna draw a nice big, what we call a garbage mat right around this wing. Okay, and we're gonna track forwards. And we're gonna to have to really adjust our roto shape because we're tracking a bunch of planes at once. All right, so let's pull this forward and pull this over here. There we are. All right. So we're really just making a garbage mat really quickly. Now I'm not worrying about whether or not this is rotoscoped well, you know, um, this, isn't, this isn't that kind of uh, scenario. But what I am going to do is I'm going to worry about whether or not this wing is completely contained within this shape. Okay, so as usual, we need to think about how that is contained. Okay, so let's go ahead and hit track backwards. And now we're still tracking the wing. And I can see that we've got to adjust this just a little bit. Now, the nice thing about Mocha and tracking a garbage mat is you don't really have to worry about whether or not it's super accurate. So for example, I'm just going to adjust the shape as we go, just like this, and keep tracking. And you see that it will animate between my two keyframes. So let's keep tracking backwards. Looks good to me. We're gonna go ahead and take this, drag this right over here. And once again, you can see it's scrolling between the two, animating between the two. Actually, let's animate all the way to here. Perfect. All right, and hit track backwards. Very nice. Yep, we're losing it a little bit because we're getting caught on a building. But that's okay. What we might need to do is just track the engine, but I'll, yeah, we're gonna have to track just to track the engine. Okay, so let's delete that keyframe. Let's come over here. And now I'm just going to really quickly, I'm going to take all of these keyframes, all, all of these points for a minute, and I'm going to just shrink them in, bring them down 
to here. And I can always delete this keyframe later, but right now I'm going to focus on just this little engine part right here. All right. And now we're going to hit track backwards again. All right. And that's holding on. So the reason it was getting lost is it was grabbing onto the more textured area behind the engine. It was finding that information a lot more delicious than what I was feeding it, um, which is just the smooth wing of the plane. So what we did is I went ahead and made my shape just smaller to the area that I want to look at to fix that problem. But now, now that my tracking data is there, all I'm going to do is I'm going to go back to that keyframe and delete it. Okay, and now, now all I have to do is just correct this shape. And that's a neat little trick because you can just scroll between two shapes. All right. Um, so I see, how can I export Mocha shapes for BTS? Can you explain to me what you mean by BTS? Um, for some reason, that acronym is not, not working for me right now. Okay, so now I've got my garbage mat for my wing. Very good. All right, and down here, we're actually going to go ahead and make this a little bit bigger there. Same thing here. And... Okay. All right, so that is a garbage mat. And we wanna make sure that we're not, you know, leaving anything behind. So we'll make sure that the garbage mat's a little bit bigger than what we need as, as we always tend to do. Let's go ahead and make sure that at no point is the wing sticking out where it's not supposed to be. Another good way to do that is once again, we can use the uh, activate quick stabilize mode, which I've told you before I really like, and here's why. It just pins everything in the middle of the screen so we can see really quickly whether or not our shape is behaving because we want our shape to behave and contain that object the whole time, just like this. All right, same thing. We're just going to adjust that, although it really doesn't matter where it's not over the plane, so I don't know what I'm worried about. Okay, so... Now, now what we have to do is we have to track the side of this plane. So when you track inside of Mocha, you want to make sure that you're tracking from areas of the most detail to the least detail, where the object is largest in frame, least blurry, and most parallel to the camera. Okay, so what we're going to do is we're going to draw a nice shape right around the side of this plane, just like this. I saw somebody say, OMG, that is a big, beautiful flower. Uh, thank you. I wear flowers in my hair a lot. Let's use the add points to explain tool and grab some more of this plane. Um, this one is a magnolia for those of you that uh, keep track of flowers. And magnolias are a, uh, a native flower to the south. Um, and they are, well, the southeastern part of the United States. And they are quite lovely and a favorite of mine. They smell incredible. And uh, they are a staple of summer. It's like how you know summer is here is the magnolias are blooming. Okay, so now we're going to draw, we've drawn a shape around our plane. And let's call this wing holdout. Okay. Funny story, uh, I once put a great big spider in this because uh, magnolias are always full of great big wolf spiders. Like um, Hogna carolinensis is a great big wolf spider uh, that tends to hang out in magnolias. It's also native to the south. And my coworker, uh, Ben Brownlee, who is also a dear friend of mine, uh, does not like spiders, and I made him quite green by putting a big fake spider in here once. Um, and uh, I don't think I will do that again because people who are afraid of spiders are very afraid of spiders. Okay, let's go ahead and track this forwards and backwards. Um, I see Bonsoir, greetings from France, and Hola from Mexico. Hola and Bonsoir, I think I'm saying that correctly. I might be butchering it, I'm not so good at French. Um, and I'm, and my, my Spanish accent is terrible, but, uh, but hello. Okay. All right. So moving on, let's go ahead and track the side of this. All right. So now I've got my plane and what you can see is I've taken my wing hold out and dragged it above my plane. Now, why did I do that? If I click on my plane and I click, click on mats, you can see that because this is at the top of the layer pile and this is beneath it, everything at the top of the layer pile is being held out from the mats beneath it. So that now when we track this in Mocha, we're gonna look in this shape, but we're gonna avoid the wing, okay? So that's how we make holdout mats in Mocha. And, it's, and if you rotoscope from the foreground to the background, you'll always have holdout mats for everything in your shot. Just 
keep in mind when you make giant holdout mats for something, they need to be a little bit bigger than the object that you're trying to hold out. If they're right along the edge, you're gonna leave those pixels um, on the background and Mocha is not gonna be able to tell the difference between the foreground object and the background object. All right, so let's track translation, scale, rotation, shear, and perspective, and let's track it forwards. Looking very nice, getting a good track there. All right, feeling pretty good about that. All right, and now we're going to track backwards, just like this. And again, you can see Mocha's looking here and not looking here. And you can see that because I've got my surface tool on, I can see what my track is doing. Now, even though this is a curved, even though this is a curved surface, all right, we can, um, we can go ahead and track it like a plane because it's still moving enough in a planar way that for a stabilized, that's all we need. Okay. How can you export shapes for behind the scenes videos? Okay, um, you can go, you can either export them in the plugin or you can export the shape right here in this little um, uh, dialogue. But you can also export the shapes. I'm, so I'm sorry, I should have read that out loud. The question is, how do we export shapes for behind the scenes videos? And the answer to that is you can either export them by exporting them right here and export shape data, which you can see is right here, and you can pick what kind of shape data you need, um, or you can export them by going to export rendered shapes, and you can render the shapes out, or just real quick, we're gonna save and close this. Um, you can go over to your mats and you can either apply the mat or you can create AE masks right here. So there's many ways to, to do that, all right? All right, so let's talk back to stabilization. Let's launch Mocha. All right, so back in stabilization, we've got our plane tracked and it looks like it's holding on pretty good. Like, I feel like that's decent. I do feel like we lose it a little bit here at the end. So here's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna do that same thing I did last time. I'm gonna zoom in and we're gonna go ahead and take our shape and I'm going to adjust my shape. Let's hit control and just shift this up. Okay, I'm gonna use my add to X-Blind tool and I'm gonna grab this tail once again. I'm gonna pull this shape forward just right here and I'm gonna grab as much of this information as I can um, while still avoiding the bottom because remember we had reflections on the bottom. So let's hit track backwards. All right, and that is a lot nicer. All right, so I feel pretty good about that. So now let's go to our shot. Let's zoom out and let's go to stabilization and let's turn our overlays off. All right, so now what I can do is I can try to stabilize based on this plane. So let's go ahead, let's let's try stabilize in all motion for a second. Let's just see what that looks like. Yuck, okay, this is why I say don't do that. So we're not gonna do all motion. We're gonna do translation, scale, rotation, and zoom. We're gonna hit track forwards. And you can see we're keeping the plane in the middle of our shot. We're kind of wobbling a little bit because I'm putting zoom on. Let's turn zoom off. All right. Very good. All right, so now I can see that I'm losing a lot of my plane. So one of the questions we had on the forums was how do we keep the plane in the middle? And once again, the answer to that is it's the frame list. You guessed it, right? So we're gonna say, keep it in the frame list and make it full frame there. And now we're gonna look for any areas where we're really, really losing the shot. So I think right here is a good candidate for a full frame. All right, and we can just keep doing that. So let's, where's the worst offender? Probably right here and right here. All right, so now if we hit play, actually let's do center, zoom and apply crop and let's hit play. So now the plane is totally stable, but you can see the ground is not, okay? And that's because we've locked the plane down. Now we can fix that too though. We can go ahead and take rotation off and hit play. And so now we're smoothing, but we're smoothing just based on the translation data of the plane 
we're keeping the plane in the middle of the shot and we get rid of that wobble that was at the beginning of the shot as well. So it really just depends on how you want the shot to look as to what, ob what um, parameters you need to change. Now, you could argue that I probably should have only tracked translation on this plane, but what I like to do is I like to track as much as possible all the way up to perspective, because if I have something I want to change, like if I don't have to retrack, you know, if I know that I have a rock solid track on the side of something, I know that I can either use all that information or I can use that information selectively. Your mileage may vary. You may say like, I know for a fact, I'm only gonna have to tra track translation on this. And so I'm only gonna track translation. But for me, I like to play with the parameters and that's why I call it art artistic stabilization. I want to see what looks best before I make a choice on how to lock the shot down. Um, the thing I really like about Mocha Pro for doing this as opposed to other tools, because there are plenty of stabilization tools out there, um, is a lot of the stabilization tools out there tend to have um, a black box that you're working within. It will look at a bunch of points in your shot. It'll try to do basically like a 3D camera solver, and then it'll try to warp the shot into a, stabiliz in into a stabilization that you might not want. So what I like to do is I like to have the control to be able to decide what needs to be stabilized and how. Okay. Now, I have one more shot I want to show you, and I have 15 minutes left, so I'm feeling pretty good about it. Does anybody have any questions about this sort of shot? I feel like I have covered holdouts, what to track, when to track, why to track, how to think about using the, the tracking data, and then, of course, how to use this frame list, which is always, always, always something you're going to want to use. Um, let's go ahead and hit save and close. Okay, I don't see a lot of questions, so let's move on. Moving right along, um, I do want to talk about this shot. Okay, this is one of those. Ugh, how do we how do we stabilize this shot? All right, I'm gonna just I'm gonna go ahead and lo load this up in Mocha, and let's press play. Excuse me. All right, let's go start later. All right, now. We have this shot. Let's say we want to stabilize this shot. Okay, this shot is clearly shot from a boat. Uh, that's kind of rough. Why is this shot shot from a boat? Now, I could try stabilizing based off this plane, but that would make all of the ocean wobble. I could try stabilizing based off this dock, and that's going to look like garbage. Okay, so if I want to stabilize this shot where it doesn't feel so seasick, how am I going to stabilize that? Well, I need to stabilize based on the background. Now, I can't stabilize based on the waves because they're moving. So what I'm going to try to do is grab this horizon as much as one can grab a horizon. So let's go to our track and let's zoom out. I'm going to take a top shape like this. I'm going to say, hey, track, translation, scale, rotation, shear, and perspective, and let's hit track forwards. And let's turn our surface tool on so we can see what it's doing. And if everything is working correctly, we're going to track that background all the way across. Okay, and we want to make sure that that surface tool stays locked to the horizon. Now, you can see that we are shifting a little bit, and we're shifting a little bit because we're tracking perspective and the ocean is moving. Now, I'm not going to worry about that right now because I'm probably only going to translate, um, I'm probably only going to stabilize using translation scale and rotation. But once again, as I said, I do like to have all of the information available to me in case I want to really lock a shot down. Okay, but let's go over to stabilize and let's do translation in X and Y and rotation with maximum smoothing. Okay, and let's turn our overlays off and let's do a center zoom and apply crop and let's see what that looks like. And now that looks nice and stable for us with a steady horizon, okay, even though we've got a whole lot of wobble in the foreground. Now, I do want you to notice one thing that we cannot get rid of, and that is, I don't know if you can see it um, on the internet or over the internet connection, but there is a little bit of a wobble in the foreground. And that actually has to do with the camera. If you capture anything like a rolling shutter issue or a uh, DSLR like wobble, um, or a motion blur that comes from just filming something in motion on your camera, stabilization in any method cannot get rid of that for you. 
So you need to be really thoughtful about how you're stabilizing when that's the case. So I'm going to show you one more thing that can help you when you have something like that. Um, you can you can try to add a frame at the beginning and end as a full frame, and you can try to turn off maximum smoothing so that it just kind of looks like a steady cam, and that'll help you get away with it a little bit. So it'll stabilize the shot a lot so it's not as sickening, but it makes those rolling shutter problems not as visible as, as they would be if you used maximum smoothing instead. So you see how visible that is when we lock the shot down completely. So it's really gonna be one of those your mileage may vary sorts of things, um, but you cannot get rid of artifacts that are inside the camera when you're using stabilization. It just stabilizes the frames. It's not magic, it's not doing anything, you know, um, like reordering the pixels. It's just moving the frames as if you would move a corner pin uh, based off of the tracking data. Okay, so that's really important to note. There's no magical algorithm that's gonna take those artifacts out of the scene for you. So one of the things that you can do to get around that is either turn off maximum smoothing or use a frame list to try to animate so that you still get some motion that makes those movements believable. All right, well, that is it, folks. Um, that is stabilization. That's a whole bunch of different shots talking about stabilization. Um, Keep in mind, uh, just one thing I want you to realize when you're doing stabilizes is if you're stabilizing a subject that's really close up and you have objects really far behind them, um, you're probably going to need to track uh, the background around them on one side of the screen and the other as close to the edges as possible. And the reason for that is um, if you've got any sort of like rolling shutter problem that comes with DSLRs, sometimes you can kind of get it out of there if you're tracking shear and perspective and you stabilize a wobble as long as it's not super, super, super obvious. So just be really thoughtful about what you're tracking and how you're tracking it. All right. So um, another question is, since I've finally figured out a Jest track, I've noticed that there's an export tracking data button on that page. Is that the same as the export track button in the tracking tab? Well, kind of. Um, if you go to adjust track, you can export your tracking data, okay? But if you go to the track tab, if you export your track, um, you're going to need to make sure that you're exporting your adjusted track. So it's better to export from here if you're going to export your adjusted tracking data, all right? Um, you can also just make sure when you link to track, when you're using adjust track, when you link to track, like let's say I have a new layer, like right here, and I say, hey, link to level one, um, link to layer one you're gonna to need to check this adjusted track checkbox if you want to get to that information as well, okay? Just make sure that that's what you're doing when you're using adjust track. All right, so um, one more question I see, is it is it okay for me to go back to the tracking tab to export both the shape and the tracking data from the same place? Yes, you can go ahead and export the shape here and you can export the tracking data here. Um, it's just make sure that when you're um, exporting the adjusted track, what I would tend to do is use a link to track and then um, adjust, well, basically use that new layer as your export track if you're gonna export from the uh, from the track tab. All right, so that is it, folks. Um, thank you for joining. This has been Office Hours. I am Mary Popple with Boris Effects. Please don't forget, next week is my very last Office Hours, and I will see you at, I, I think, 1 o'clock. I think we're doing it at 1 o'clock, but I have to double check because I have to see when the team can show up because it's going to be kind of like a goodbye um, for me. So I really hope to see you there. And uh, I really hope you enjoyed these office hours so far. I do believe office hours is going to continue. Um, I got to work with the team and figure out who's taking it over. But uh, please stay tuned for more office hours in the future. Um, but they will just be minus Mary Poplin. So thanks so much for tuning in and I will see you soon.